Okay, we're going to um, get started, and I'm sure some uh, people will filter in as they get lunch. Uh, my name is John May. I'm the um, director of the Master in Design Studies program here at the GSD, and we are uh, very happy to host um, Jose Esparza Chong Kui. We were just saying it's an extended name, uh, who uh, is a friend of the GSD. We know him well because he was a finalist in last year's Wheelwright uh, Fellowship cycle. Um, he is, for a few more days, the Pamela Alper Associate Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. And I say a few more days because, as most of you in the room probably know from the recent announcement, he's also just been named the new director of the Storefront for Art and Architecture, which is a really vital institution for our fields, um, both nationally and internationally. So we're uh, excited. I will say he's, his lecture has been on the schedule for many months, so we're not just we're not just jumping on the storefront bandwagon. <laughs> we are, we were at, we've actually been longtime fans. Uh, this is not a, this is not a, a bandwagon um, lecture. Um, uh, Jose um, uh, recently co-organized a major collection exhibition to celebrate uh, the Museum of Contemporary, uh, uh, Contemporary Art uh, Chicago 50th anniversary and has uh, curated shows on Tanya uh, Perez uh, Cordova, as well as a major commission with uh, Federico Herrero. Uh, his upcoming projects include a large-scale retrospective on the life and work of Lino Bobardi, which we're looking forward to very much. Um, prior to the MCA Chicago, Esparza um, was associate curator at the Museo Humex. Uh, from 2007 to 2012, he lived in New York City um, and held positions as curatorial associate at Storefront, so he's headed back there. A uh, research fellow at the New Museum and contributing editor at Domus Magazine, which I'm sure many of you have seen uh, things he wrote at that time. Um, in 2013, he was co-curator of the Lisbon uh, tri uh, tri Triennial, which was titled Close Closer. Uh, he's a graduate of Columbia University's MS in Critical Curatorial and Conceptual Practices in Architecture, and he will start November 1st, or even sooner. Yeah, he's already started, basically, uh, in his new role as executive director of the chief curator at Storefront for Art and Architecture. So um, Jose will talk for a little while about some of his previous work, and then we'll leave time for a Q&A afterwards where we can ask him what his plans are for going forward. Okay, Jose. Thank you all for coming. Um, it really is an honor to be here today and share um, some of the work that I've been work that, that I've been doing, um, and as well as some ideas, information um, for the work I'm. I'll be doing at Storefront, um, but um, really, this 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 talk is going to be a quite a kind of like an informal session, um, and really pretty much describing this kind of like path that somehow is leading me back to Storefront. Um, and I'll talk about some of the projects that I, I worked on um, throughout my career that um, was just somehow um, presented. Um, so as hinted in the talk's description, I would like to, like to use this opportunity to have an informal conversation about exhibition making and institutional building uh, through a selection of projects I've been involved in over the last decade. In other words, this presentation will focus mostly um, on curatorial practice, uh, the role of the curator, and how this career is usually shaped and assembled um, in ways that might seem somewhat unorthodox, um, especially for the like architecture curator, uh, since there isn't really a clear path one should follow to pursue this, this type of career. Um, the timing for this talk, as uh, was mentioned, is quite serendipitous since from the time when I received the invitation and today, a uh, significant change in my curatorial career happened. Uh, very specifically, as it was mentioned in the introduction, uh, I have recently been appointed executive director and chief curator of Storefront for Art and Architecture, uh, which is a position that I'm uh, honored uh, to assume starting November 1st. Um, Today, though, I'm here as associate curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, uh, where I've been since 2016. Uh, but of course, it's been a, impossible for me to avoid thinking about what's to come, uh, which is, in a very, in a very direct way, uh, tied to what I've done before. And when I say the timing is quite unique, I also mean it quite literally, um, since I'm in the middle of a move from Chicago to New York City, which is actually happening this. Tuesday, uh, Monday's my last day at the museum, uh, so it's, there's a lot of things happening, and while this invitation, as it was mentioned, it came before the announcement, it was really throughout, the, throughout those months where I was preparing for, for this new position and 
the interview process, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been, it's been a lot. <laughs> Uh, so please bear with me. Um, I know this presentation is meant to focus on, as I said, ideas and formation, uh, which is something I've been thinking a lot about as I transition into my new role at Storefront. I'll begin by doing a brief introduction of myself as a curator, which I think will help set the stage to later discuss this idea of the cycle or the life cycle, which I allude to in the talk's title and description. Uh, and which is also an idea that I've been going back to a lot since I uh, uh, as I step down from my role at the MCA Chicago and prepare for this new position. So something that on a very personal note is meaningful to me uh, about the role I'll be assuming is that it was at Storefront where I began my curatorial career over a decade ago. Uh, first as an intern and then as a curatorial associate working on specific projects with then director Joseph Grima. Uh, I began in early 2007. Uh, when as an intern, of course, like work ranged from, 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 from pouring wine at openings uh, to helping out with a production installation of exhibitions, uh, and as well as being involved with a pop-up projects abroad, such as um, the series that was launched during Joseph's tenure that was called Postopolis. It, I, th I think in a way somehow speaks to, to, to that 2007 period uh, of the rise of blogs and uh, it was like Jeff Maynard from Building Blog and a bunch of these kind of like characters that are that are somehow still uh, operating within the extended field of architecture. Um, it gathered, it convened them in Los. We did two editions in one in Los Angeles and one in Mexico City. Uh, but also, I was involved in um, st some of what were Storefront's first kind of uh, editorial projects. Um, from I remember this book that we worked on with Work AC in the context of uh, their first exhibition at, well, their, their exhibition at Storefront uh, called 49 Cities, but also one uh, that I was very fortunate to be able to work on was uh, this two-volume compendium called Storefront News Prints, which compiled all of the printed material that Storefront had been publishing from its founding in 1982, um, throughout the time, I think it was 2009, when we published it. Um, and this, um, I don't know if, if some of you might know that Storefront from, from, from its founding has been producing these, these, these newsprints um, that are mail outs uh, where basically it, it, it's the announcement and the invitation to the exhibition, but it's also so, some, some of them uh, have, have much more information about the exhibitions that are presented, the people involved. Um, this is uh, one from 1994 uh, of an exhibition curated by Beatrice Colomina and, sorry, I can't, Dennis Dolan, Sidney Payton, eh, Eva Kofsky, and Henry, Henry Erbach, and Mark Quigley in 1994, titled Queer Space. Um, really, I think I, I see this, um, this the, the, the newsprint kind of publication that's still ongoing as a, perhaps one of the most insightful um, pieces to, to, to know more about Storefront's history. Um, and I'll be getting back at this um, in a bit, but... Um, from Storefront, I, I moved on to work at Domus Magazine, I, also with Joseph Grima, as he had just left a Storefront um, and um, moved on to Domus as editor-in-chief. Um, and while at Domus, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to, to, to contribute through a different kind of range of practices from, from inviting people to uh, inviting art, art, artists and architects to to work on our covers that Joseph had just launched uh, uh, was commissioning each cover to a different architect. This is uh, by Frida Escobedo. Uh, I can't remember the year of that, uh, but it's quite early on. It was just as she had done the 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 Tallera Siqueiros, uh, wrote, of, wrote in many cases for, for the magazine, uh, mostly about things in, in, in Mexico and in, in Latin America. This is a project by um, Pedro Reyes. Uh, it was a, a, a series of uh, a performance where he transformed decommissioned um, weapons from the drug wars uh, and turned them into, into musical instruments. Um, to we we when Joseph arrived at at, at Domus, he also like relaunched the mag, like the website, um, and and we started really trying to kind of expand the reach of um, 
of of what architecture was covering, um, and I was really mostly focused, as I mentioned, um, in in covering uh, projects in Latin America. So from from an article on Lino Vardis Casalvidrio to to uh, the Biennial in Chile, uh, uh, international competition in Mexico City, um, and recent buildings there. Um, but also, we we were kind of structuring the magazine in a different way and started and launched a, a series of of um, of, of, of kind of sections from, from this one that focused in highlighting young practices. Um, we, we, we did this studio visit section uh, where we featured architects like Mayo, um, who actually, Anna, was a um, wheelwright prize winner two years ago. Um, two featuring other projects, right? Um, but um, by this time, it, it became very clear to me that my interest in the field of architecture was mainly in spaces for the production and circulation of ideas, and decided to pursue a career within, within the curatorial field. Um, in 2010, I began my graduate studies at GSAP uh, in a program that was very new at the time, uh, the MS in Critical Curatorial and Conceptual Practices in Architecture. I believe I was a, the, the, there was only a year, uh, it was founded in, 2009. Um, so I was the second kind of class that I uh, joined that team. Uh, I mean that that program. Um, the position of the architecture curator, of course, was not new. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, this was the first program to formalize it as a study within a uh, university. Um, as students, um, for, for us, it was also clear that, um, that there was many different interests in, in, in our colleagues, uh, and nobody really had a clear idea of how to practice this like architecture curator that we all somehow uh, were interested in. Um, and um, yeah, and it was something that was just completely different from, say, the 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 the, the standard or, or 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 the or the art world curator, right? So, for example, if you think of uh, Bard's uh, Center for Curatorial Studies, which was founded in 1994, um, and and the like where, where all the pretty much all the students there are pursuing an institutional career, right? They're all uh, in search for, for, for positions in, in museums or nonprofits um, elsewhere. For, 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 for us, it was, it was quite, quite different, and we all kind of like took very different paths. Um, and, and so with some colleagues, we began organizing um, some independent events uh, hosted at the university and supported by the university, um, such as uh, the symposium that was titled, uh, that we titled Interpretations, and we focused on exhibition practice. Uh, we were really trying to kind of like understand what this like architecture curator meant or what like distinguished an architecture exhibition from an art exhibition. Uh, of course, the, 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 the distinctions are quite quite evident to some, but, but um, it seemed to me that the conversations that were happening in, 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 the, in the curatorial field within the art world were, were much more advanced uh, than, than those uh, of the architecture curator. Um, and after, after during, or during my, my second year of, um, of studies as, uh, at GSAP, I, I was invited to to co-curate the Lisbon Architecture Triennial um, in 2000. So we began working on it in 2011, and it was presented in 2013. Um, and uh, it was titled Close Closer, um, and with Beatrice Galilee as chief curator. Um, so here I developed the public program, uh, which took place entirely in a public square. Um, and commissioned major pieces by Frida Escobedo uh, and uh, so, so, and Andres Jaque, um, and really, as I as I mentioned, the whole the entire program um, took place in this um, kind of tilted stage designed by Frida, where we hosted many kind of informal and planned events. Uh, from this convening of uh, the mayoral candidates at the time of Lisbon that came to present their their urban related plans to, uh, it was kind of unannounced, so it was quite exciting to see the, the, uh, everybody gathering around this public square, um, to also working with Andres Jaque, where I commissioned his first um, kind of like full-length play, or his first play, actually, um, which was titled Superpowers of Ten um, and presented in uh, the square. And actually, Frida's stage somehow doubled a, 
it became the the seating space when um, when this when the play was presented. Um, we put up this. She, she designed this curtain that eventually opened up um, to the to the to the performance, um, and really it kind of inverted the role of the stage, where the city somehow became the backdrop um, for for the performance. Um, and and this idea of like the expansive the expansive city was was crucial in Andres's um, a sort of a plot line in his Superpowers of Ten. Um, so as I was finishing um, the Lisbon Architecture Triennial, uh, I was moving from New York City to Mexico City. Um, and uh, there I somehow, I, as I mentioned, launched a competition with Domus and this space called Archivo de Diseño y Arquitectura, which was kind of a new space that had recently opened up in Mexico City that was thinking about housing a collection of architecture and design um, and thinking about uh, different strategies of displaying. We launched this this pavilion competition, which uh, Pedro Juana, a design studio from Mexico City, uh, won. And this was the, the, the proposal or the project. Um, but um, yeah, so I eventually began working um, in 2013 uh, at the Museo Humix. Uh, which was about to open its doors to the public and was really the reason why I, I moved to Mexico City. I had begun conversations with uh, the director and the chief curator I, as while I was in New York, uh, and I moved, uh, as I was finishing the Lisbon Architecture Triennial, moved back to Mexico City with the intention of joining this, this very new and very kind of young team. Um, this move was uh, really important for me since it, it was clear that if I wanted to pursue an institutional career as a curator, um, I had to search kind of beyond the possibilities of what we know as the architecture curator. I, but also, um, it really seemed a, it really seemed like at the time finding an institutional setting in New York was also uh, quite complicated. Um, I had just finished graduate school, as I said, in 2012. Um, and it's really nothing new to say that uh, curatorial positions within institutions are scar quite scarce. Uh, and of course, the curators, curatorial positions focused specifically in architecture are even more, right? Um, one could easily map out those kind of that exist, right? Um, there's, of course, MoMA's Department of Architecture and Design, uh, with Philip Johnson being perhaps the first institutional curator, architecture curator, uh, with that department, which was founded by him and opened in 1932. Um, and really, if you, if you just think, think of 1932 as like the year when, when, when this career was somehow officially um, launched, they, there hasn't really I mean, while a lot has happened, not, not many other institutions have opened up that can s somehow support this, this other type of practicing architecture. Um, there was, of course, Storefront, uh, and Eva had just been uh, an announced as director um, or had been there for, for a couple of years. Um, of course, there's the Van Allen and, uh, and, and really not, not many more. Um, and the Met, for example, didn't open its, a, its position. It's not a department, but a position of a curator of architecture and design in 2014. So before 2014, they didn't really have any structure uh, or any institutional setting for, for thinking about architecture and design within, within the institution. Um, so that position was opened in 2014 with Beatrice Galilee as um, the inaugural curator. Um, and hope, who knows, perhaps that, that could eventually become a, a department in its own, but so far it's, it's kind of like this one person operation, and like in many other kind of museums where they're introducing the, 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 the the concept of the architecture curator. Um, beyond New York, there's a, you all know here, the Montreal's a CCA, of course, and there's like the Max Center in LA, um, and a handful of others, but but the options are without a doubt quite limited. Um, so therefore, my, my time at Museo Humix became a very enriching experience. Um, it not only exposed me to working in the field of contemporary art, uh, which I was always curious um, as I was uh, in architecture school, uh, but it also exposed me to a larger institutional setting uh, where we had a 
a collection, an education, an editorial department, and, and, and a budget, <laughs> really. Uh, <laughs> what was uh, perhaps most fruitful was that I joined this team right before the museum opened its doors. Um, and many of the decisions of how of how it would operate were still up in the air and discussed by the curatorial team. And this was from program to internal working strategies or equipping the building uh, with support furniture. And I remember when we first um, moved into the building, it, uh, there was a date for, there was an opening day and the building really wasn't ready. Um, and, and, and it was really interesting to, to, to move into this building that's meant to be a museum. And, I don't know, no one really thinks about the first day of the museum opening um, and, and all these like, these pieces of like furniture equipment that are needed to support the program, right? Um, so it was quite bare. Um, of course, we had the exhibition spaces, but then there's also like from the lockers to really everything else, like where you put the leaflets, et cetera, et cetera. So um, being involved with, with, with the institution from, from, from day one uh, was quite exciting because we, we even got to make decisions from like commissioning all of these like forgotten, um, forgotten pieces of architecture or that, that somehow did David Chipperfield some, somehow forgot to design, right? Um, and we invited this, this um, group from Mexico City called uh, Apropiación del Espacio, Rodrigo, who's actually here, uh, to, to design all of these, like from, from the seating of the security guards to, uh, to all of these kind of like missed um, things that are usually not thought of as architecture really, but like f support furniture, but are quite essential to, to run the institution. Um, and um, where am I? I, I, while at Humex also, because I guess it was so young, we got to do like a bunch of things that maybe I wouldn't have been able to do elsewhere, um, from organizing of lectures, events, and performances in a very <laughs> kind of informal way, uh, to hosting, I don't know, the, the, the Chicago Architecture Biennial Curators, uh, uh, the first Chicago Architecture Biennial Curators, Sarherda and Joseph Grima, who were doing this like trip to Mexico City. And everything was like done in this very informal way, but it was quite exciting to be able to, to commit to doing these things and to, and to provide space for them to happen. Um, to, I launched a series of exhibitions titled Pasajeros, which translates to passers-by, um, that somehow focused in, in the passing through Mexico of, of interesting kind of cultural figures that are somehow unknown, but that left a deep impact within their field. Um, so the first one was focused in, in Jerzy Grotowski, this Polish um, the theater character, um, director, uh, and I invited an um, uh, architecture studio from Mexico City called Lanza uh, to design the, what would be like the display uh, space where, where everything would be presented. Um, and this was reconfigured for, a, it, for, for, for each of these editions. The second one we did uh, was uh, focused in Esther McCoy, um, who had a very close relationship to many of the archi modernist architects um, in Mexico City and was, ve was really writing about uh, the, the building of the UNAM campus or the, or the building of El Pedregal and the developments and making these very interesting connections between, between modernist architecture in Mexico City uh, and Los Angeles. Um, so these are somehow like un unknown histories that we try to surface through, through this, through this pop-up exhibition series. Um, publish these booklets and trying to give shape. I, I also I was involved in uh, this major kind of commission series that we launched uh, that focused in performance and we invited Pedro Reyes, the first one was Pedro Reyes to do, uh, I don't know if I have an image, yeah, um, an hour long also a, a puppet play called uh, La Revolución Permanente, The Permanent Revolution. Uh, which focused in, uh, which is the title of uh, Trotsky's uh, compilation of, of writings that he assembled while he was in Mexico City. Uh, and it, some, it somehow tells a story about capitalism and, and, and 
communism through 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 marionettes, uh, and it was a this hour long play that we transformed that this this space that I showed earlier that same space where pretty much all these shows are it's in this um, in this multi use space that uh, it was really interesting when talking to David Chipperfield as uh, the building was opening. Um, so the museum, while it looks kind of like a big building. Um, it really only has two galleries, which are the top two um, like white cubes, really. And then the, the, the first floor, which is, this, which is this entire space, is completely left unprogrammed. Um, and while it, it was, I guess, mostly thought of as almost like an event space, party space somehow, um, Humix was quite known for doing, throwing this like pretty large parties. Uh, before um, and uh, as we were starting to program and work on the building, this space somehow became central to think. Uh, other than like the, the 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 white cube kind of like exhibition program, this space really became somehow a a, a very essential part of um, of the life of the uh, of the museum. And we it was where we presented our more kind of like more experimental projects that maybe would be difficult to, to produce elsewhere. Um, and that's where we commissioned this uh, Pedro Reyes's piece, uh, which we did, uh, I think, 45 presentations uh, in a month. Um, and it was like, towards the, towards the end of the run, um, I think we had like 100 um, seats. Uh, towards the end of the month, it was like, it was all fully sold out. So it was really exciting to see how, I mean, how we were communicating our, ambitions and goals through the museum that was new that that was trying to kind of like make a space for itself within the cultural landscape of uh, museums in Mexico City um, and trying to position I believe that um, next week Julieta Gonzalez who's the artistic director is going to be here so I highly recommend you um, to come to her talk as well um, to a big performance also by Alexandra Vaxetsis uh, that was also held 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 in that multi-use space. Um, to, I worked also on uh, big collection exhibitions where it was fun to be able to experiment and work with, a, in this case, like Dexter Sinister, who designed the, the full identity of the exhibition, but also Pedro Juana again, who designed a, the, the, who did the exhibition design. Um, and again, of course, a, it was, since it has a plaza that I think Julieta's talk will focus on the plaza of the museum, um, it was fun to, it made sense to invite Andres Jaque again and, and represent um, his superpowers of 10, which was actually pretty successful also in Mexico City in terms of it, uh, attendance. Um, and I'll go back to my notes one second. So. Being that it was like, such a young and unique institution, I was, as I said, I was able to experiment with curatorial formats and organized events, um, and organize start exhibitions, commission new performance-based works, and curated collection exhibitions. And considering uh, that, the, that the point of this talk is to think about exhibition practices and, spaces, and the spaces that host them, uh, perhaps it's worthwhile to kind of expand on this uniqueness of the Museo Humix, uh, this museum which opened its doors as I said, in 2013, is a, a private museum, like most here in the United States, but with a significant difference. Rather than being funded and governed by a board of trustees, it is, um, it is a company, Grupo Humix, uh, which makes and sells juice um, that supports the program entirely. Uh, the museum project is a branch of the Fundación Humix, uh, which was founded by Eugenio López Alonso, uh, who's the son of the founder of the f this family-owned company. Um, this unique situation where the program is fully funded by one main patron is, of course, quite uncommon. Uh, but working here really got me thinking into these different um, institutional structures, right? I had been um, at Storefront, which we'll go back to in a second, um, then at Domus, which is in itself an institution, while it doesn't have a space, it's in itself also actually a family-owned family -owned company um, that publishes many other magazines, primarily actually um, the income comes from a magazine about cars. Um, and, I, and Domus is somehow 
like the humix of of that mother company, right? So it's like that pet project. Um, uh, uh, this really humix was came out of uh, the interest of, of of the son of this of the owners of this company, who was very invested in in, in the arts and first opened a foundation that was uh, doing. Started, st started collecting art um, and had a space, a, a warehouse space by the, by the factory of the juice production, really, where, where the juice production takes place. Um, and over the course of 15 years, this collection grew quite large and, and, and the project started gaining a lot of visibility um, and it started to make sense to open uh, a new space. The foundation was kind of like recontextual, re the foundation was started and then with the intention of opening this museum. Um, so being involved with the Museo Jumex made me realize not only about the importance and impact uh, that a cultural organization can have, but also about how I wanted to commit myself to understanding the way they operate and pursue a career within institutions. In 2016, I moved to Chicago to assume a new position as associate curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Um, and here I've organized um, solo exhibitions. Um, this is a completely different institutional setting from Humix. It's a, a museum with a, a board of trustees of around 60 people. Um, and it's a highly kind of structured and orchestrated um, cultural project. Like really, like most museums here in the US. Uh, but for me, it was very interesting to to be able to experience, or, or, or my, my interest in joining the, the, the MCA Chicago or US Museum was to, to understand the different, uh, the differences uh, of, of, these, of, of how these cultural institutions operate, right? Um, I organized this first solo show of uh, Tania Perez Cordova, an artist from Mexico City, um, this major commission by Federico Herrero, an artist from Costa Rica. Um, I was involved again with a, the collection and made acquisitions for the collection. This is something that at Humix, while it has a collection, I, I, the curatorial team or the museum, it doesn't really get involved with the collection. It's mostly, um, the collection grows of course, but mostly through the owner's own kind of like advisors. The museum isn't really involved in the collection. So, so a, being involved a, at the MCA and understanding how it's, a, how it works with its different committees from the collection committee um, to the exhibition committee um, and, and how we present these works and think strategically about how to grow the collection has something that was very interesting. Um, this is a, a still from a video by Jonathan Ziandrade, um, an artist from Recife in Brazil, who, which we acquired his work and now I'm working also on a solo exhibition of his work that is due to open in April. Um, and I'm still working on a couple of projects at the MCA Chicago that uh, I'll continue overlooking um, from my new role at Storefront. Um, so, and I'll continue overlooking them as curator from a new role at Storefront. So, uh, Jonathan Ziandrade opens in um, April, uh, but also, as it was mentioned in the introduction, I'm working on a major retrospective um, that focuses on the life and work of Lina Bobardi, um, titled Habitat. I, um, and for me, this is a really exciting project, um, not only because uh, Lina, of course, is this fascinating character, but um, one of uh, the major kind of accomplishments of this project, as I see it, um, is that we are co-organizing and co-curating it between the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, which is MASPI, this museum that she designed in 1968, um, and also the Museo Humix in Mexico City. So the exhibition actually opens next April uh, in Sao Paulo first, uh, then it moves up to Mexico City, and then it makes its way up to Chicago. Um, for me, having these, these institutional partners from Latin America was essential to, to communicate the project as well. Um, as a curator working in a US museum, as a Latin American curator working in a US museum, um, it's been very interesting to see how, how, how many of these, these, these artists are discovered uh, by these museums, right? And then, and then somehow shipped back to, to Latin America as if like, now that they have the stamp of approval, um, they're worth considering, right? Um, so I, for me, it was essential to partner with, uh, with, with MASPI, which is a project that Lina was of course very invested in. Uh, MASPI, um, was not only founded, 
founded, or her husband, Pietro Maria Bardi, was, a, was the founding director and was the director there for, for, for I think, over 50 years, actually. So, so and, and they worked very closely. Um, so, so Maspi is really one of her kind of like made very, very important projects. Um, and um, so we're, we're in, in the exhibition, we are um, uh, reproducing some of, um, some, some of her kind of essential projects from a selection of the glasses. We're bringing some of the glasses to Chicago and um, showing works from the collection of Maspi, uh, which uh, were actually kind of many of which were hung originally by Lina herself. So Maspi has a, a quite a, an important European collec a collection of European masters. Um, we're doing that to to kind of like represent like representing other seminal exhibitions that she did, such as this one called uh, Amau do Povo Brasileiro, which translates to the hand of the Brazilian people. Uh, really, one of our focuses in this exhibition is to 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 present Lina as this um, important, really cultural figure uh, like beyond just being an architect, right? She was, she was a, an architect, but uh, of course a designer, but, a, but also was very, very invested in exhibition practice and institutional building. She, she, throughout her career, she did many, many projects that were um, involved with, or kind of rethinking and looking at a popular, popular art and like the handcrafted object. Um, she even founded a museum uh, in the 50s uh, in Salvador Bahia, uh, which was the Museo de Arte Moderno in Salvador. Um, and the exhibition will, will, will recreate many of um, her projects. So, so the, the, this iconic staircase um, that's in, in the museum that she founded and, and redesigned in, in Salvador. Um, but perhaps one of the most um, exciting things for me, as I mentioned, was um, that we were able to collaborate with these two institutions in Latin America, specifically MASPI. Um, and, and, and another very exciting thing that we're doing um, next year when the exhibition opens in uh, Sao Paulo is that uh, we are, I mean, as I'm talking about like these institutional structures and institutional kind of ways of working, uh, one of, I think one thing that we're most excited about is um, we're doing a collection exchange with Maspi. Um, so the MCA Chicago is loaning um, a big selection of works, around 20 of our major works, uh, to, and we're sending them to Maspi's uh, picture gallery, um, and they'll be displayed on these glass easels. Um, and Maspi is sending around 17 works from their collection that are going to be displayed within the Lina Bobardi exhibition. Uh, but this, this kind of like long-term exchange that we're doing, I see it as, as, as a kind of as a way that institutions can collaborate uh, with each other that on, on these projects that somehow seem like quite complicated and, uh, uh, and, and, and ambitious, but like, but, but really making an effort to create these, these, these institutional ties and institutional collaborations, especially at, I was very particularly interested in, 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 in collaborating with institutions in Latin America. I, um, is, is, it feels like quite an accomplishment, and I think that it, it's an exciting project for audiences in Sao Paulo as well as audiences, audiences in Chicago. Um, So, yeah, the MCA Chicago really allowed me to understand a completely different structural organization uh, for nonprofits uh, with, a large, uh, with its large board and committees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, doing a recap of the work I've done over the past decade has been kind of crucial for me to understand not only where I'm at, uh, but, also, but it also got me thinking about the unconventional paths within uh, the curatorial field really kind of like going back and forth between the, 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 archi the architecture world and, and the art world. Um, and looking back has also made me very aware of the different institutional structures out there um, as I transition into my new position at Storefront for Art and Architecture. So 
Returning to Storefront uh, now as director has really kept me thinking about um, these cycles and some somewhat like circular experiences uh, about how somehow one thing builds upon itself and how it's transformed throughout the process about the life cycle of inst exhibitions, institutions, ideas, and experiences. Uh, this, of course, comes from a very personal analysis of my professional background, uh, but uh, but it's been very interesting and useful for me to think and explore this idea of the cyclical, the interconnected, through the institutional history of cultural nonprofits. Um, so just, I don't know how we're doing with time, yeah? Um, so just a brief recap of Storefront um, and its kind of history. It was founded in 1982, I mean, I'm guessing that some of you are familiar with the organization, but it was founded in, not everybody really knows its history. It was founded in 1982 by, by, by an artist and an architect, uh, Shireen Ashat, who's this uh, quite famous uh, artist from Iran and Kyung Park and architect uh, from Korea that's, I believe, now based in San Diego. Um, and it, it really began as this storefront and the, the, the opening pr uh, with the intention of presenting a uh, work that was at the intersection of art and architecture, uh, which I think is to this day uh, one of its main maybe assets really this like very it has a very unique mission that that I don't I can't really think of many other organizations that are focused specifically at working at this intersection. Um, Storefront, of course, um, while it was founded in 1982, for me it's always important to contextualize it within the broader panorama of cultural organizations that were founded in New York around that time uh, because it is not detached from that. Uh, and sometimes we forget that many of the organizations that we now know, th that we now see as these like big, big museums uh, started somehow just like storefront, right? Um, and I see um, the MCA, for example, actually, it was also founded in 19... 1967, and I always see this period as somewhat a break between the modern art museum museums and uh, the contemporary institutes, right? So 1968, around that time, is really when many artists were doing a completely different type of art, which is what we understand as contemporary art now. Um, and, and, and these uh, organizations were, were, then, were, then start, were then founded by really just individuals who were interested in showing, showing their work because their work didn't really have a space in, in, in these modern art museums. Um, so, so the Studio Museum Harlem was founded in 1968. The Museo del Barrio was founded in 1969. PS1 by Alana Heiss in 1971. I, the Kitchen in 1971 as well, Artist Space in 72, The New Museum by Marsha Tucker in 1977. And like uh, all of these places were, 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 um, were part of this kind of network of cultural organizations. Storefront is, is really a part of that, of, of that era. Um, and, and as I said, they created these spaces because there was no other space, because, because the official institutions weren't really showing their work. So for example, the New Museum was the first contemporary art museum in, in New York City. Um, Marsha Tucker was a curator at uh, the Whitney Museum and, and, and her curatorial ideas maybe were not as well received um, and she decided to start her own project. It began as a, as a it was on the second floor of a, a, on Broadway, it now is this major museum that keeps growing, right? Um, I think that, that, that seeing where these other organizations are vis-a-vis -vis where Storefront is, is, is also quite telling about um, the funding and the, and, 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 and the investment of, of these cultural supporters or these patrons, right? And, and, but it also, of course, opens up to, 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 to possibilities of where Storefront could go. And of course, I'm not saying that it's, it's going to become a new museum, but, it, but, it, but, but there is possibilities of, 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 of growth, right? I, I don't mean physically, really, but, but institutional growth. Um, Storefront um, has, f uh, just again to do a recap of its history, has done these like really, really in fascinating shows from, from Queer Space, which I showed from 1994, that was kind of curated, this like superstar like curated show. <laughs> in 1987, Jerinsko Fidio, their first exhibition called Body Buildings um, from Petra Blaze in 2000, uh, El Weissman and, uh, and Rafi Siegel in 2013. 
it, we're already, of course, focusing on on the border. Um, so a, only now do I realize how much somehow being exposed to this history continues to shape me, and it's exciting to begin thinking about Storfen's future program. Uh, while perhaps very preliminary, I, I've decided to title this talk uh, Building Cycles, uh, which in a way provides some hints into the conceptual approach I'm currently thinking for Storfen's new program. The choice of words intentionally refers to both the lifespan of a building, but also to the process of a building. Um, as I said earlier, I'm very interested in ideas and formation and how these can unfold to reveal or surface new meanings. Creating an open structure that focuses in the processes rather than in a proposed goal will of course inform the end result. As I see it, both the exhibition and the institutional space are sites where we can create and resurface connections to things that can be meaningful today. An exhibition is a site for stimulation, be it critical or sensory, personal or collective, which is inhabited momentarily. An institutional space, in this case a cultural institution, is a mission-driven organization that continuously provokes and presents these ideas information. And um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, this very important lecture by, by Foucault the, of other spaces that many of you have probably know and have read here, but I really like this, this quote where he says, um, uh, we are in an epoch of simultaneity, of juxtaposition, of the near and far, of the side by side, of the dispersed. Um, he said he believed that our experience of the world is less of a, life, of a long life developing through time, but more like a network of, uh, that connects points and intersects with its own scheme. Um, therefore, as I've tried to make clear, I, I see a lot of potential in how an exhibition and an institution can shame, can shape and inform our present. I see both of them as a building a, in the process of construction. There's the preliminary work a, you do with the pre-existing site conditions, the building of the foundations, the rising of the walls, which somehow gives way to, to the creation of new spaces, and perhaps the most important step, a, the inhabitants inhabiting the space, right? Um, I understand building um, as a process in which ideas form, grow, adapt, and regenerate. And my goal as a curator is to build exhibitions and institutions with, str with a strong foundation that can help us navigate our complex contemporary world and also shape it. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Pass a mic in, in a minute for um, audience questions. I think one one question that came to mind as you were talking is um, uh, at the outset there was the question, and it's funny because you, you put it in air quotes. Um, the, you know the architect curator um, or the architecture curator, and and one maybe the, an initial reaction we might have is that that needs to be more strongly defined. And yet, as you spoke. Um, you, you spoke on either side of a series of binaries, institutions that were organized in a sort of heavily sort of vertically integrated versus vertically disintegrated organizations, HUMEX versus something like MCA. Um, also, you're crossing, of course, national boundaries with a lot of your work. Um, and then just in the name itself, storefront for art and architecture and the sort of, the sort of duality that's built in there. It, as you were speaking, it makes me think that maybe part of being an architecture curator is actually an ability to be somewhat ambiguously in both places, you know, in, in, on multiple levels at the same time. So I wonder if you might, I mean, I'm sure this, they'll, the students will have other kinds of questions, but maybe you could speak to that for just a minute. I mean, like, if you, we, we've had, you know, Zaina and I in our, in our own practice with exhibitions in, in Los Angeles or in, in New York, we always know that with the curator there's a question of um, what, what do you label an architectural object for the art collector? And so we will make large scale architectural models that then the curator will, you know, very, very strategically label sculpture for example, uh, in the hopes that it sells uh, in some way. And so, or, or of course, furniture has always been a kind of crossover moment, right? So, um, but maybe you could speak just a bit about that, th this ability to have, uh, uh, to exist in both realms simultaneously, maybe. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, honestly, I don't think of myself as an architecture curator, really. I mostly, I think I practice as a, as a curator and it's, it's completely different things. I think in really there's, um, 
there's a market for the art for, for the art curator um, and therefore that's why uh, many of those institutions grow as fast as they grow and are, are funded as have bigger money yeah. basically um, the value of the art grows as well um, with the passing of time um, it's interesting to think about works that are acquired for museum collections that I am um, for a kind of decent price and then years later um, they're worth maybe more than the whole organization, really. Um, it's, um, I don't know, I think, and I guess maybe that's what, one of the reasons why, I mean, not, not that there's a market for it, but 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 um, one of the reasons why I somehow just like felt like I had to branch out from working specifically in the architecture world um, and try to, to, to understand the way institutions worked um, from the art world, really. Um, it's, the architecture curator is much more research-based and they present um, a, or at least like the formal architecture curators, it's mostly representations of works, right? Um, rather than the real object. But then of course, um, for example, in Lisbon, we weren't really showing, while it was an architecture triennial, we weren't really showing, um, floor plans and drawings and models and whatnot. I, we were dealing with architectural subjects. Um, it just didn't translate into into the official kind of like technique of the architect. Um, and I think that's certainly something that that's go going to be the case at, at Storfront during my tenure. Um, it will be an exhibition program that's informed by the built environment and that's informed a, by by architectural preoccupations or spatial preoccupations uh, but 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 hopefully it will be much more kind of a uh, curatorial experiments that try to present both a mixture of um, artists and architects working um, in experimental fashion I don't know if there's any other questions Congratulations on your ah, um, <laughs> congratulations, um, congratulations on your on your new position and, and on your fabulous lecture. It's really beautiful, actually, to really know you. Besides knowing you, but really know your work. Um, it was very interesting the the slide that you put about like the the genesis of the creation of all of these institutions in New York, and now they're like most of them, like the new museum, are like behemoth in terms of funding, and they have like a brand new buildings designed by Stark Architects and. And certainly, like the, this is a reflection of New York City as an art in the art market. Like, the underground became the establishment. Mm -hmm. um, the storefront was underground, and I don't think it's establishment yet, but it's certainly the budget. Exactly. Denies it. So, so <laughs> tell me a bit more about that perception of growth when obviously physically gro physical growth is pretty much impossible. Uh, funding growth, uh, it's always a struggle, as per Eva used to say all the time that you know you have those parties and stuff. But t talk to me about, t tell me a bit about the engagement with the with the overall cultural uh, market in New York and how the new storefront under your mm -hmm. under your um, you know under your management will you would like to like work on like what's your plans in that sense of growth I'm I mean, curious I, I think that a big reason why why storefront has somewhat um, I mean while while it's maybe a international presence and visibility and 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 kind of impact in the architectural community um, has without a doubt grown um, the budget and the space and and like the the infrastructural kind of like the real infrastructural um, apparatus um, hasn't grown as much um, is of course because as I said there's really no market for the architecture world like like architecture isn't commercialized in the way that like a uh, art there's no there's no architecture fair you know like there's biennials but these are exhibitions there's no there's there's not a freeze art fair or like a an armory art fair where like architects present their work and it's like circulated within within these like and these patrons are buying it and are invested in it and want to support it so i think that a big reason for it is um that it architecture just exi exists completely not not outside the market of course there's a it's a very different system but um but there isn't. We aren't at a place where where it like supporting 
these projects has, um, I don't know, something that um, the art world has somehow managed to find a way to fundraise for, the, for those organizations that I think that the architecture world hasn't yet, but I don't think that, that it's impossible. And it's certainly something that, that uh, I'd love to kind of explore. Um, for me, it's very important to, um, to, to be able to, to grow. And when I say grow, it, as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean in square footage, uh, but, but, but to grow like a healthier institution um, and, and, and really find a way to be able to do projects um, with a reasonable budget where um, there's fees for participating artists and architects. You know, like it's, a, it's a very precarious organization and it's fantastic. I think that also one of the reasons why it's precarious, uh, one of the reasons why it's been able to kind of maintain its independent voice um, is a because it's precarious, precisely because it's precarious. Um, so there's, in a way, not much at stake really. Um, so it, it maintains as this kind of experimental place where where it projects that. Eva, for example, organized couldn't have been organized elsewhere. I think that, for example, if you think about the, I mean, just like the exhibition history, Sir Herda's tenure also did some incredible, um, incredible exhibitions that um, that I think are even more meaningful now than they were back then. And uh, this project with Julie Alt and Martin Beck, I mean, she was just awarded a. a this huge, what's the name of this prize? The MacArthur Grants um, from Chicago. Um, it's 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 very it's very interesting to for me to see the history of exhibitions and um, and think about why they were able to happen, um, and that will definitely inform the future program. But I also think that. It's just a completely different world even now than when I started working there as an intern in 2007. Um, there's a um, bigger awareness of um, institution. Like when, when I started there, the new museum hadn't even opened its doors, like the new building, the sauna building. Um, so like that whole area changed uh, quite dramatically. I think the new museum opened in 2008. Um, but but not only the area, but like the, the cultural landscape of institutions and how they're funded and like the amount of money that goes into them. But also it's very important to, to be able to, for me to be able to maintain a balance between, between yes, pursuing a bigger supporters and more um, committed and committed supporters uh, with uh, uh, a program that remains autonomous and critical uh, and experimental. So. Hi. Uh, so congrats and uh, thanks for sharing. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe also talk a bit more about your agenda, if there is any. Uh, you showed the slide. Uh, with a few exhibitions that were done by the storefront uh, over the past few decades and they were touching on all kinds of social issues from gender identity mm -hmm. to affordable living etc so how are you relating to that on the one hand and at the same time I think you um, you join an organization that is in a radically different city than when it started so maybe you can talk a bit about how you see the city in relationship to your uh, plans. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that last question somehow hints at what I was just saying about how the landscape has changed, and 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 while it's of course going to be informed by the the exhibition history and 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 like the founding mission of the organization, eh, as you said, um, and as I said, it's a very different New York, really, um, and all we'll have to be smart um, about how we plan out uh, uh, a program. Um, my agenda really is, um, I mean, this is something that I think a lot about actually, and I, I, and I always kind of avoid answering that with like a punchline. I, I think that it would be a mistake to tell you that like I'm doing this like, social, critical, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I think that, um, I mean, while of course I hope that it's all that, uh, I also hope that that somehow 
unfolds over time and that it's a program, a cohesive program. For me right now, one of the most important things is going to be to to plan out a cohesive program in advance and hopefully be able to to launch it and announce it uh, within the next month. Um, but before I do that, I, I have to start working there, actually. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, start and discuss it with the board, discuss it with the staff. Uh, of course, uh, it's not like I'll be working completely independently. There's a it, there's an apparatus, as I tried to um, to convey throughout my talk. There's an apparatus that that supports it and that is also invested in the program and that is going to help me achieve that goal. Um, so. While I have many ideas, I think it, it would be best to, to, to share those once, once I'm there uh, and, and, and get a, have a little bit more time to articulate this, this agenda slash non-agenda. Um, that, that, um, I can say this, that like, um, I, w I, I want it to be something that, that, that somehow like builds over time, and that's why I was kind of like um, using this concept of the of the cycle or the cycle of a building, um, something that one is a, each exhibition is informed by the previous exhibition somehow, and that together they are able to convey a message that is unfolded over time. I think that also the idea of the cycle is a um, is a very interesting model because. Cycle, of course, repeats itself. Um, and if you are hoping to gather a community of, uh, of people around the organization, um, it's important that, that they're able to understand what you're trying to say. Uh, and, 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 and I think these like one-off events, while of course there will probably be one-off events and many other things, but um, I, I would want to be able to, commu to, to communicate my program and like the organization's intentions through something that somehow repeats itself, and and of course not not with the exact same thing, but like but like trying to communicate something um, that, as I said, is uh, will eventually unfold over time, and then I'll, I'll share more more about that once I, I get started. But it, that's a little bit of a of a preview. So, um, Jose, um, thank you and congratulations again. Gracias. Uh, so, um, thinking on uh, curation and disseminating cultural, uh, in cultural about architecture in society, for me it always sits in, at the intersection between talking to the discipline, uh, to the profession, to advance knowledge or to provoke ideas, at the same time to con talking to the general public uh, with the pursuit that the, what architecture is better understood by the people and also architecture can regain agency nowadays and in the future. So I think this negotiation sometimes is difficult, particularly in exhibitions, also in, in magazines and press media. So looking at your trajectory and your previous um, work, but also in what you have in mind for the future, so how do you position yourself in this intersection and, and what are your ideas about it? Yeah, I, I, I think about that a lot, actually. Um, and in a way, I'm, I currently work at a museum that's almost like the opposite of Storefront, right? Storefront is like a niche organization. Uh, I currently work at a museum that has um, 6,000 visitors in one day, um, and it's a staff of 250 people. I mean, it's not a huge museum, but it's it's not MoMA, but 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 it it means something for the city, um, and for 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 not only for artists, it means something for like a general audience. Storefront, I think that um, is at a, almost like at the other end of the spectrum where it means something almost only for architects. <laughs> <laughs> at first I would, it's actually very interesting that like w with the announcement of the news, um, a lot of my friends from the art world were like, oh, what's, what, what's Storefront? <laughs> I, which <laughs> they're like, why, why are you leaving a big museum with a big budget? Um, and it's kind of true, like storefront over the last, I would say like decade has mostly been catering to, uh, to an architecture community. Um, I think that it would be somewhat foolish for me to say that um, I will make it meaningful for a, the general audience and like we're going to have like, we're going to have um, these like a student led programs. I mean, of course we, Ideally, that's going to happen at some point, right? In the organization's kind of like 
future. Uh, but right now, trying to expand it um, into the context of a, of, of a general audience, I think, is, 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 is something that's quite complicated. And, and at first, I, I would want to reintroduce it into um, the broader art world. And then from there, make it start making it meaningful for for other groups of people. I I think that um, there's something that's very interesting because it, uh, about the architecture of the space because it, as I said, while it mostly only serves and is of interest and meaningful uh, for the architects in the city, uh, it's like the most public organization, right? It's basically a sidewalk. Um, um, so, I mean, maybe through through the way and the use of the space, we can make it meaningful for for the people that pass by, that live around there, and and slow. Like, I guess what I'm saying is that like it, it's going to be a long process um, for for the organization to be able to change it to shift its audience. Um, at the MCA, we think a lot about audience, um, and even the way we write. Uh, 150 word text. Um, we have someone that reads every single one of these texts that like is the general audience, right? So like every single concept that you introduce there is questioned and tried to be shaped so that it can be understood by the general audience. Um, I think that Storefront is going to allow us to do very different things and hopefully eventually we'll be able to design strategies to, to expand our audience. Great, okay, thanks. So much. Thank you.